Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the uh, our talk on the COVID-19 mini series. It's the uh, uh, one of our series of talks that we uh, have been undertaking over the last number of weeks. My name is Donald Finn. I am the uh, facilitator for today's session. Uh, I'm a member of the ASHRAE uh, Board of Governors, and I was past president in the year 1819. Uh, this is our agenda for today, so I'm going to give a very, very short uh, introduction. I'll then introduce our, our, our speaker of today, uh, Dr. Stephanie Taylor from Harvard. Uh, Stephanie's talk is about uh, 40 minutes, as you can see there, and then we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers, and we'll close uh, at uh, 2 o'clock today. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, everybody is muted uh, by default and also your, your uh, webcams have also been switched off. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use the uh, question option, which you can see on the right-hand side of uh, the GoToMeeting uh, facility. Uh, if you have any difficulties, please send a question or an email to secretary at ashrayireland.org. Uh, the talk will be available afterwards, and there's also a short survey at the end. There are three questions, uh, which we would really like if, if you could take time to, to complete, because it helps us to make sure that our future presentations are, are as good as today, or even possibly better. Uh, well, just a, a very brief word on our response to, to COVID-19. We, we, we have a subcommittee that's focusing on the area. We've been hosting a number of technical uh, webinars. This is one of those uh, on, on, on the issue of more generally airborne infectious diseases, but also in the context of COVID-19, particularly in the context of HVAC. And you can see here there is a, a, um, a synopsis of some of our activities. We've had some, some presentations. Um, they can be reviewed. Uh, they're all available. There's also been some, some articles as well. And our website has up-to-date uh, information. Uh, the, this summarizes the, the series of talks today. So we're, we're on talk number four here with uh, Stephanie. And we also have few, uh, four future talks uh, planned. We will release the details of those uh, once we, we finalize them. In terms of ASHRAE resources, there, there's various um, technical resources available. Uh, on their website, there's a dedicated session that deals with the whole issue of COVID-19 and the uh, associated systems from a HVAC perspective. There's also uh, an epidemic task force, which ASHRAE has set up. And there's a, a Q&A as well as a specialized section uh, dealing with that particular task force. There has been a number of documents uh, published in recent weeks uh, that are given there. And also there is a literature resource uh, available through their um, handbooks, standards and guidelines, as well as their ongoing uh, technical journal articles. And there's also a ASHRAE Learning Institute that has uh, a lot of information available on issues that are associated with uh, ventilation and uh, buildings in the context of infectious uh, diseases. And this here gives a summarize uh, or a summary of the various topics which are uh, available uh, to members on the ASHRAE site. Today's presentation, well, I'm delighted to, to be the host today uh, in collaboration with uh, our secretary, Daniel Coakley, for the fourth in our series of talks. So our panelist or our presenter is Stephanie. Uh, Taylor. You can see the background about Stephanie there. She is a medical doctor at Harvard Medical School and she also has a, a master's in the area of architecture. So this combines this uh, unique combination of both uh, a medical understanding but also as well from a building and architecture perspective. So without any further uh, ado, I'm delighted to, to welcome uh, Stephanie to our talk today, and I'm going to hand over to Stephanie. In fact, Daniel is going to do this, that to us, so this will take maybe 30 seconds while we hand over from Dublin to Boston, Massachusetts. So Stephanie, uh, I'm delighted that you've had time available, and I'm going to, well, if we were in a venue, I'd say the floor is yours, I'd say the screen uh, is yours now. Well, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? We can indeed. 
Okay, now I have to just minimize this because I don't want, oh, I just minimized the wrong thing, sorry. Okay, well, I am very honored to be here. Um, Ireland is a very special place for me. My uh, father was from Ireland and I, I have been there once and had a fantastic uh, trip. That was quite a few decades ago, but nevertheless, I'm happy to be here. And so, yes, I am a, a, a physician. Been a phys I've been a physician for many years. And eventually I woke up and realized how important the built environment is to human health. So at that point in time, I went back to school and got my master's in architecture. And um, here I am today, very honored to, to speak with you. And I've come to the realization that protecting public health, protecting human beings is really uh, more in the hands of everyone in the audience. It's in the hands of building professionals, whether you're an engineer, an architect, a uh, facility manager in construction. Buildings have a tremendous impact on our health. And you'll know a little bit more why I say that uh, after my presentation. So to get moving, uh, I'm happy to be here. That's me when I'm seeing patients. I'm a pediatric oncologist at, at Harvard, Dana-Farber, as well as doing the work uh, with ASHRAE. So what I want to talk about in the next 40 minutes is how, despite the devastation that this coronavirus has wreaked on our economy and on our society and lives have been lost, there's also an opportunity that's been revealed and we need to act on that. And then I wanna talk with you about some new studies um, on human beings indoors. And then finally, uh, I'd like to open the question and get your input about how do we really move forward um, managing buildings with human health in mind. So our prior priorities have been rearranged, but before we get into that, I just wanted to share with you how I, as a physician, uh, came to be so interested in the built environment. And this is me back uh, several years ago when I was in medical school. I decided I wanted an adventure, so I went to Papua New Guinea for four months. So you might know Papua New Guinea is a little bit north of Australia. It's kind of near the equator. And you could, I was living in these villages, uh, working in somewhat rural settings, this was the main hospital uh, that I was stationed out of in Wewak, New Guinea. And you can see the conditions are not what we're used to in North America or in your country, in Ireland. The family members would stay with the patients. In the middle, you can see the men's tuberculosis ward. A lot of outdoor air ventilation. The beds were fairly close together. And on the right, that's me in the operating room. I'm wearing flip-flops. Uh, as we call them. Those were the shoes that everyone wore in the OR. The surgical nurse didn't have gloves on. So you can see that the conditions are, are more uh, rustic than you're probably used to. And yet these patients did well. They went home when we expected them to. There were not a lot of new infections. So looking back on this experience, especially because uh, in North America and in most countries, going into the hospital and getting a new infection is a big problem. As a matter of fact, in the United States, um, it's one of the leading causes of death. This slide shows, um, that's my son's uh, medical school CE, uh, director on the left who had a ski injury, went into the hospital to get his, uh, his meniscus repaired, almost lost his life and lost his leg from an infection that he got from the hospital. The little girl is one of my patients. Uh, who survived her leukemia, survived chemotherapy, almost to die of an infection. So in the US um, and in the UK, this is a huge problem. And yet, why did those patients in New Guinea not have so many infections? So again, looking back in time to medical school, I remembered my mentor, Dr. Folkman, who was an incredibly brilliant, wonderful man. And he and I were doing research on uh, melanoma metastasis. And 
one night around midnight, I called him up and I said, Dr. Folkman, our mice are dying. The study mice are dying, the control mice are dying. I don't know why. So he came into the lab in the middle of the night and we scrubbed the operating room down from top to bottom. And Dr. Folkman told me, never ever underestimate the power of your environment in dictating and in determining your health. So that made a big impression on me. So speaking of the environment, you know, if we take a very rapid uh, look through history around human shelters, human spaces, you know, many, many centuries ago, we lived in dwellings that had a lot of communication with the outdoor air, soil, animals. And then over time, our uh, buildings became more sophisticated. We developed sanitation systems. By the Industrial Revolution, unless you were in farming or agriculture of some sort, most of us worked indoors. And now in 2020, in the post-industrial uh, era, a lot of us work in buildings that are sealed with, with non-operable windows. Uh, the indoor environment is dry, it's warm. You could go to work in bare feet if, you're, if your boss allowed you to. So our buildings have become very sophisticated. However, unfortunately, many diseases have also increased. And so here I am talking to you virtually because of the coronavirus, so I don't even need to talk to you about diseases. But now we have more infectious diseases. We have more diseases related to inflammation, such as inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, even cardiovascular disease is related to inflammation. So even though this isn't a statistically significant chart in front of you, it bears uh, asking the question, is there a relationship between how we're managing our buildings and this rise in many types of diseases? So now we're dealing with uh, this coronavirus uh, pandemic. It's not our first pandemic and it's not gonna be our last. If you look throughout history at the viruses that cause these pandemics, they're always in the same family, in the single-stranded RNA virus. And the reason uh, this viral family tends to cause pandemics is that it mutates. This specific virus mutates very easily. And the reason that that occurs is that it doesn't have the, the proofreading capabilities of most types of viruses. So it's kind of like, my eighth grade son, he would write a report for history and he would send it off to his teacher without proofreading it. So all the mistakes went with the report and he would get a C. He's now a doctor. So he, he'd somehow managed to learn how to proofread, but this virus has not. And so what happens when the coronavirus replicates, it's very careless. So there are a lot of genetic mistakes, but if one of those genetic mistakes results in a stronger strain, or a strain that we don't have any immunological defense against, then the virus can grow rapidly, it can infect new people, and hence we have pandemics. So now that this has happened, and what are we doing? Well, we're waiting for medical professionals to get their acts together, at least in this country. You know, we have testing, we're waiting for a vaccine or effective treatment. We have certain behavioral protocols that we've been told to follow, but there are problems with these. Testing, uh, the availability and the accuracy is, is questionable. We really don't know exactly when there'll be a vaccine that will be uh, created in sufficient numbers for everyone to be treated. And the protocols are difficult to quantify. So, you know, us medical professionals, we're, we're trying, but we're not really doing a great job at controlling this. But if you think about the role of the built environment and the ability of the built environment to be managed in such a way that it is more protective of human health, we have a whole nother set of tools. And this is where your work is critically important. So let's take a look at some studies that begin to, begin to indicate, well, what should we be doing in buildings to protect people? And how do we know if our intervention strategies are effective? Because really, why do we have buildings? You know, in the past, a long time ago, we just wanted to be protected from the rain and the snow and earthquakes and floods. And then before COVID, energy efficiency was 
really the the big emphasis and that is still very important because we don't want to be pouring carbon emissions into our atmosphere however COVID-19 has really highlighted the importance of indoor air management and building design and management to protect humans. So before we look at the studies, I just want to show this video to you. I hope you can all see this. So as I'm talking and you're all breathing in your offices or homes, little droplets come out of our airways about 100 microns in diameter, and they carry all of the normal bacteria and viruses that are in our airway. And you can see this engineer or architect is working away. She's leaving her skin particles, skin flakes on the paper, on the table. That's normal. All of the bacteria that normally reside on her skin are on those particles. You can see droplets coming out of her nose. Again, that's very normal. Her GI tract, her digestive tract, is illuminated because we have lots of bacteria in our GI tract. But you can see that this woman who's bathed and showered and clean, she's shedding her normal skin and body particles into the air. And depending on how the air is managed, how turbulent it is and other characteristics, there's more or less communication between surfaces and the air. And then depending on how sealed your building is, outdoor particles will go inside and indoor particles can come out. So the point of that video is just to help you understand that human beings live with many microbial communities in buildings and outdoors. And that's good. Most of them are good for us, but not all of them. So how do we figure out which ones are good for us and which ones aren't? And how can we figure out how to manage our buildings to uh, foster human health? So now I'm going to now I'm going to uh, take you through a couple studies. This first one um, actually was done in a hospital, but the, these studies don't have to be done in hospitals. And we're not just talking about a hospital building. We're talking about all buildings and the impact of the indoor environment on occupants. But hospitals are a great place to study the role of the built environment on human health. So just think about that for a sec. If you really want to understand the impact of your building or your indoor environment on people, it's great to be able to have data on the people, not just to follow particles or room air changes or pressurization or uh, you know, other air cleaning strategies, but actually to use human health data as your final metric to tell us what we're doing right or wrong. So this study that's in front of you um, was one that I was involved in actually in 2015, where we took a brand new hospital in the Chicago area. So cold winters, warm summers, and we monitored all of those things you see listed there, temperature, hand hygiene, uh, protocols, pressurization, CO2, humidity, room traffic, everything listed. We monitored those parameters every five to 30 minutes for a little bit more than a year. So we had about 8 million uh, data points from the environment. And then we studied, or I looked at the clinical outcomes of all the patients who were in the rooms that we monitored. So brand new hospital, all single rooms with private bathrooms. They all had vestibules. We had about 400 patients to follow and about 8 million data points on the rooms. So just think about what which of those parameters do you think might have had an impact on these patients getting new infections while they're in the hospital? So I thought that probably hand hygiene would be the most important correlation or perhaps room traffic. So we sent all of these data points off to our statistician. Sorry, this is out of order. This is just showing that how we manage our buildings actually selects for the organisms that are going to survive. So we send our data off and to my great surprise, our statistician, statistician came back and said the most important indoor parameter that was associated with more infections is dry air in the patient room. So I thought, I thought this was a mistake. We fired our statistician, we got a new one. The new statistician said, 
Just because you didn't expect this result doesn't mean it's wrong. When the relative humidity in the patient room was low, low meaning just a little bit less than 32%, the infection rate was high. And when the indoor relative humidity went up over 40%, the infection rate came way down. So I saw this data and I thought, well, this was, uh, it's also seasonal. So I thought, well, we've missed some important variable. But again, our statistician ex explained again and again, this is an independent variable and it's relative humidity, not absolute humidity, um, which is something that engineers don't really like to think about. Most engineers would rather talk about dew point and, rel and absolute humidity. But this was actually related to the indoor temperature. I was still skeptical, so we did another study. This one was in a nursing home over six years. So these people didn't leave the nursing home until they, they passed away. But we looked at indoor and outdoor climactic factors and the infection rate in the elderly population. And once again, the most powerful correlation was when the indoor relative humidity was low, so on the x-axis, when the indoor relative humidity was to the left, the infection rate especially respiratory and GI infections. Respiratory rate was high when the relative humidity indoors was low. And there's this magic zone, 40 to 60% relative humidity, where our infection rate in this nursing home was at an all-time low. So if you think about COVID-19 and how devastating the disease has been to the elderly population, this is a really important finding. So a third study, uh, this was done by the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, looking at influenza A illness in a preschool. And this is a great study because half of the class, half of the school was humidified to 45%. So you can see on the, the left-hand side of the slide, half of the school was humidified. The other half was left to do what happens with buildings in the winter time. Cold winter, you bring in outdoor air, heat it up. Unless you add active humidification, the, the relative humidity is going to drop. So half the school had a relative humidity of 20%, the other half was humidified to 45%. And you can see that there were some really important differences in the, in the transmission and in the infectivity of influenza A. In the humidified part of the school, um, there were many fewer infectious particles in the air, the ones that were there were less infectious, so they were like less virulent. And then ultimately in the humidified classes, there were fewer children sick. And this study was repeated in four other schools with the same finding. So something about humidity, um, in at least in a specific range, seems to be protective to human beings. So let's just take a look at some of the science behind uh, what might be going on. So here's Say this woman has COVID-19. She has the bad manners to come into your office or your home without a mask on, and she starts doing this. You know, probably you'll want to throw her out. But if, if you don't, you might say, well, what are the chances that I'm going to get sick? And you can see as she coughs into the air, some of the droplets are large and some are small. So how can you manage your building or your home so that your chance of getting an infection is minimized. So it ends up that there are really three places where you can stop the transmission of uh, infectious diseases. The first step is really behavioral. That woman comes into your house, you know, you can lock your door, not let her in, but that's not really an engineering solution. Um, you know, we talk about social distancing, we talk about mask wearing to, to decrease the introduction of the of the virus into our environment. The second column, viral transmission in the built environment is really where we, we generally focus engineering strategies. And yes, you're probably aware of this, but uh, the World Health Organization and the CDC in the US has been very resistant to accepting the, the science that shows that this virus in fact is spread through airborne transmission over distance. And there's enough data that we really need to embrace this concept and manage our buildings to decrease long distance transmission of uh, the SARS virus. 
So back to relative humidity, we now know that when the air is dry, we have greater aerosol transmission. It's harder to clean surfaces because if you remember that video, you have particles landing on surfaces and then being resuspended and then resettling out of the air. So even if you previously cleaned a surface, when you have recontamination from the airborne environment, you know, even if you haven't touched anything, or even if something hasn't touched your surface, you're gonna have recontamination from the air. And then thirdly, for reasons we don't really fully understand, in low relative humidity, infectious particles in, in expired droplets are actually more infectious. And again, we don't know all the mechanisms of that. But again, to go back to the transmission, I'm talking, you're breathing, I hope you're breathing. Particles, droplets come out of our airways about 100 microns in diameter. And in low relative humidity, those droplets shrink rapidly. They desiccate to, to reach equilibrium with the, with the water vapor of the air. And when the humidity is low, those little droplets shrink even further. And by the time they get to be smaller than 10 microns in diameter, they float and travel through the air for long distances and for, for quite long periods of time. And we used to think that these little tiny droplets or particles of 0.5 microns, we used to think that any infectious material, viruses or bacteria within that droplet was, was dead because we couldn't culture it very easily. But we now know with newer uh, testing techniques that even though the virus can be dormant or the bacteria can be dormant, they're generally not dead in these tiny particles. And once they land in someone else's airways, they rehydrate and are infectious. So, and, and this is a study, this is really interesting, showing that with influenza A, when you have low relative humidity, again on the x-axis, low relative humidity is associated with highly infectious influenza A virus. And at 40% RH, 80% of the viruses are inactivated within 15 minutes. So just think about that. 40% RH, 80% of the viruses are inactivated in 15 minutes. That's a very powerful uh, phenomenon. And with many organisms, the infectivity can go back up at 60% ambient relative humidity. But there's a sweet spot, 40 to 60%, that seems to decrease the infectivity of many viruses and bacteria. So that was influenza A. Let's look at the coronavirus. So this, this is a logarithmic graph. If you look at the y-axis, it's a log scale. And on the x-axis, we have days. And when the ambient relative humidity is 20% at comfortable temperatures, the coronavirus uh, stays infectious for long periods of time. That's the black line. At 80% relative humidity, indoor temperatures, which is really too humid, we wouldn't be comfortable, you have some inactivation, but the blue line shows the relative humidity of 50%, which is right in the middle of the 40 to 60. And you can see you have the fastest inactivation of coronavirus at that mid-range humidity. Pretty fascinating. So if you put these things together, how, and again, I'm, I do not sell humidifiers. I don't really even know much about humidifiers, except that now I have one in my home. But um, I'm not a, a salesperson for humidification units, even though it might sound like I am. Anyway, if you bring all these factors together and look at the relative humidity impact on the overall infectivity of the virus, on contact transmission, on aerosol transmission, put all this together, we're seeing this very marked uh, protective effect of relative humidity at 40%. What am I doing? Because I've got a few more minutes. So what about the third column? the vulnerability or the, the susceptibility of the, the non-infected person or the secondary host, how do we try to protect other people from getting sick? And usually we think about, um, we leave that up to the medical profession. We hope, we hope for a vaccine, we hope for effective treatment. If we do get sick, you know, we're encouraged to get enough sleep, to exercise, to eat well, basically to keep our strength up. So the third column, 
the vulnerability of the secondary host is not something that we generally think about as being associated with engineering strategies in the built environment. However, even that column is impacted by our buildings. So this is a study uh, done by Yale to answer the question of why do we get the flu in temperate climates anyway? Why do we get influenza in the winter time? So studies have finally narrowed it down to the outdoor absolute humidity, which correlates with the indoor relative humidity, is the most powerful variable, more than crowding, more than vitamin D deficiency, more than melatonin changes. It really is the indoor relative humidity, which has been isolated to be uh, very impactful in our susceptibility to the flu. So this Yale group said, was trying to answer the question, what happens to human physiology um, at 50% relative humidity versus 20%? Because if, if you're infected with the flu uh, in, the, in the summer or in the fall or spring, you might get a little bit sick, you might not get sick at all. But in the winter time, that's when you run the chance of getting really sick. So this, this study that I'm gonna tell you about was actually done in genetically engineered mice because the lungs were taken out and chopped up and you can't really do that with, with your patients. So mice were genetically engineered to have the same immune response as humans. So let's take a look. How do we, how does our body naturally protect us from respiratory infections, such as flu or, or COVID-19? So say that woman comes into your home and coughs and puts influenza or coronavirus into the air, you know, we run the risk of inhaling those particles. The first line of defense against these viral pathogens um, is the mucus in our airways and these little hairs called cilia, which are constantly washing upward. And the cilia, the little hairs uh, that are in the mucus, help prevent infectious or, or damaging particles from reaching our, our lungs. You know, it's one thing to get a sinus infection or a sore throat, but you really don't want things settling down into your very uh, vulnerable lung tissue. So the mucus and the cilia help trap things and wash them upwards. Second, if something does sneak by the cilia and the mucus, we have cells in our body that come in, they're called macrophages or dendritic cells, and they, they're sort of a secondary line of defense. And they secrete proteins called interferon that are protective for us. And if necessary, the rest, the other branch of our immune system uh, is brought into play to help protect us. Well, this Yale group found that at 20% ambient relative humidity, all of these immune defense steps are actually impaired at 20%, but they're optimized at 50%. So you might think, well, it's kind of understandable that the mucus in our airways becomes thicker, you know, dehydrates. That's a little bit intuitive. If you fly on an airplane, you know, you might notice that your eyes, your mouth gets dry when the humidity is low. So the mucus thickens up and the cilia can't work very well. But in addition to that, those other steps are impaired in dry air. Our macrophages and dendritic cells don't make interferon as effectively. Cells don't come in and repair inflammation. So all of the strategies that are sort of naturally given to us as people to protect ourselves are impaired in low relative humidity environments. So again, there, there are many strategies, there are many uh, tools to help, quote unquote, clean the air in a building. You know, there's UVC, there's uh, bipolar ionization, room air cha changes, filtration, and all of those things definitely have a place. But maintaining this very natural and healthy uh, relative humidity zone not only decreases the transmission and the infectivity of viruses and bacteria in the airborne environment. But in addition, that amount of water vapor supports the human immune system. So this isn't entirely new information. Um, some of you may recognize this chart, the Sterling chart from ASHRAE 1985, showing that if you look at all these different ailments, bacterial infections, viral infections, sort of respiratory in general, allergies and ozone problems, you have 
more problems at low relative humidity and more problems at high relative humidity. But there's this sweet spot, 40 to 60%, that's really beneficial for humans. And if you take all of the new data that we have using um, newer metagenomic analysis techniques for the viruses and bacteria, using a lot of human health data, we're still finding this sweet spot of 40 to 60% indoor relative humidity, which is healthy for humans and it decreases the infectivity of the harmful microbes. So it's like mother nature gave us this opportunity, 40 to 60% relative humidity, which you often find in the outdoor environment, even in the winter because it's cold. So relative humidity is still balanced. But you know we've created these beautiful buildings, we've sealed the environment, we've heated them up. And unless we add appropriate amounts of water vapor, it seems like our health is harmed. So if I go back to, um, to uh, my experience in New Guinea, I think, I think, well, okay, so there was a lot of outdoor ventilation. This country is along the equator. So you had outdoor levels of water vapor being brought into these spaces. People had very robust immune systems um, and we weren't selecting for the pathogens by how we managed our, our indoor environment. Um, so I think that's a significant factor. And if you look at infections like influenza or even COVID-19, we're not, well, we don't know enough about COVID-19, but let's look at influenza. We don't see the seasonal shifts in countries along the equator. We still have the flu, but the transmission uh, vector is usually contact. So the further you get from the equator, the more you see the seasonality of most respiratory viruses with the illnesses being worse during the heating seasons. So how do we, how do we implement change in how we manage our buildings? How do we begin to use human health as a building metric? And how do we begin to sort of rethink our relationship with indoor humidity? Because if, if, if you're honest with yourself, a lot of us think the only good humidifier is one that's turned off. You know, we don't like them. They, you have to maintain them, you have to run them. A lot of people think they're a nuisance, but we really need to begin to manage our buildings without drying them out to the extent that we do. So in this sense, COVID is a wake-up call. It's not a wake-up call only about the need to humidify and to learn to create building envelopes that can maintain moisture appropriately, but it's a wake-up call about the importance of the built environment in protecting people. And, and by using the lens of human health as a, as a way to assess our buildings, you know, we've learned that for, for now, Dry air is harmful. It's harmful to people, and yet the bad viruses and bacteria, they love it because it, it fosters their uh, spread. So I hope I've been within the time. Thank you. That's uh, my, my, my little guy, Luigi, who's under my desk right now. And if I ever get to come to Ireland, um, often I bring him with me when I travel. So thank you, and I'll be here for questions. Thank you. And you can that have this presentation with really other bibliography. Sorry. Thank you, Stephanie, for a really interesting talk. Um, I think it was really interesting your, your perspective from a medical perspective, but also from a buildings and architectural perspective. So we have a number of questions, um, which I'll put to you. Can I start though, with one general question first? Um, the key message coming from you is this sweet spot, spot between 40 and 60% RH in the internal environment seems to give evidence of lower transmission of infectious uh, diseases. Do you have a, a, a reason or a hypothesis as to why that is insofar as, I know you explained it in the context of the human lung and the cilia, but let's say from the perspective of the transmission of the droplets, um, is, do you have any explanation yeah. as to why you think it's or what is happening there? I mean, that's a great question. So again, there are two factors. There's the strength of the human being and 
you know, we, we talked about that. But then there's what happens to uh, infectious particles that are in our droplets. So at 40% relative humidity, those little droplets, they don't desiccate as quickly as they do in drier environments. So they fall from the air into onto surfaces where they can be wiped away uh, for once and for all, rather than being in the breathing zone. So then you you might be thinking, well, what about at 60% RH? So a secondary effect, not of humidification, is not only are they brought out of the environment, but something happens to the uh, structure of the virus or the bacteria, so that when you get when you're lower than 40%, the salts in the droplet actually preserve the infectious material, and over 60%, again. We think it's the concentration of salts in the droplet that that uh, that the concentration between 40 and 60 percent inactivates the the virus or the bacteria, and less than that preserves it, and over 60 percent allows it to survive in a more dilute environment. But and the other thing we're seeing at over 60 percent, you have more contact transmission. So. Again, for a multiple for multiple reasons, some of which we don't really understand, that 40 to 60 percent zone seems to be critical for uh, suppressing the bad microbes. And and most most microbes are not bad. Most microbes are good for us, and we can't live without them. But clearly, mm -hmm. ones like COVID-19 are are harmful. So to answer your question, we know some of the reasons, but we don't really understand all of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I have a few more questions. And, and before I go to the next question, I can report here in my study that it's 24 degrees and 59% RH. Um, that would be quite typical, probably a little bit on the high side for RH. Um, we, we've quite a few humid days right at the moment, but certainly for non-HVAC controlled naturally ventilated spaces, typically here in Ireland, RH inside covers around the 50%. So I have one question that actually follows on quite nicely from the earlier question, and it's from Liam Talton. And his question is, uh, uh, as a droplet containing coronavirus evaporates and gets smaller, what happens to the viral particles? And I think you've partially answered that question in the previous one, but it, it might be worth just closing out on that. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a, that's a, so that's a more specific question and a good question. Um, when the droplet shrinks, and it does shrink once it comes out of your airway, um, the, the salts inside the droplet tend to become more concentrated. And when the concentration is between 40 and 60%, um, the, the, the viral RNA or DNA is, is inactivated. Um, and then over that, over 60% concentration, or sorry, over 60% relative humidity, the droplet salts are more dilute and it doesn't have that same effect. Um, if you send me an email, I think, yeah, there's my email address. I can send you some papers that talk about the impact of the salt concentration in droplets on viruses and bacteria. But since you've asked that question, I just wanna alert everybody. When you're reading papers about the viability of COVID-19 in, in the air on surfaces, read the papers carefully because unless human uh, mucus and proteins were used in the study in the droplets you get different results early papers were coming out using a uh, saline solution to sort of mimic droplets and there was a different effect so people have said well wait not all the studies support this but all the studies that have been done with human uh, mucins and proteins show that 40 to 60 percent is inactivating for this virus. That's a little and science. I have, another question, I have another question here from Lorcan Mooney. Um, he asks, and in, in, in this case, is what is your view or your thoughts on the addition of uh, ultraviolet lamps to air handling units? I think UVC has a very, uh, very good place. Um, you know, I think that there has to be enough exposure time of droplets or of the viral particles to dissociate the RNA. Um, so you can't have super fast airflow. I think UVC can be effectively, 
especially effective at cleaning coils. You know, obviously you have to be careful to decrease human exposure. Um, one of my concerns about UVC is that we're beginning to see resistance to uh, short wave light in both bacteria and viruses. So I think we have to be aware of the long-term consequences of that intervention. Uh, we don't want another superbug uh, evolving like we have antibiotic resistance. But I think UVC has a very good place, especially in ductwork around coil cleaning. Thank you. Um, two or three other questions. We're, we've still got about five minutes. So uh, John Ashley asks or observes that in Belgium, uh, relative humidity measurement uh, is by law um, basically legislated for. And, and the question is, how common is it, let's say, in, in the United States to, to, to control your RH within buildings well, by legislation? That, that's a good question. You know, there's the, there's what's been, well, there's what's recommended or mandated, and then there's what's actually done. And so in the United States, unless your building is a museum or um, a library with very valuable books or some kind of building that houses materials that need humidification, like a computer server or a wood manufacturer, most of our buildings are not, the humidity is not maintained, even in hospitals, unfortunately. So be careful, you know, what people say they're doing and what they're actually doing in the user spaces are often two different things. It's just like when I drive, I don't always listen to the speed. I don't always obey the speed limit, even though it's posted. I mean, I try to, but mm -hmm. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stop with that comment on okay. that. Okay. Um, a related question from uh, Michael Gert. So the, the observation is that we don't record RH in Irish hospitals. Should we be doing so? Definitely. That, I mean, the first thing we need to do is start monitoring this because we don't have sensors on our skin for humidity like we do for temperature. And so unless we monitor it, we don't really know what's going on. So that's a thank you for that question. That's a really good point. And maybe to extend this as well also from Michael Garrity, um, all of your talk has focused on hospitals, which obviously is where your expertise, li expertise lies. But what about the issue of schools? Because this has been very much in the, I guess, most of the public discourse, at least here in Ireland over the last few weeks. So um, do you think it's equally applicable in the school and let's say university environment? Absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear because the findings, the, the first study was in a hospital. The second study was in a nursing home that's constructed very much like a private residential facility. But the, what we found in hospitals actually applies to all of us in buildings. And if you look at the ASHRAE recommendations for school reopening, um, and I take some credit for this since I'm on the epidemic task force, the design parameters are now to keep the relative humidity indoors between 40 and 60% in schools. And so I think in schools, offices, in your home, monitor your relative humidity and try to maintain it within that range. If it's really cold out, I, you know, where I live in Northern Vermont, if it gets to be zero degrees, I have to turn my humidity down so I don't get condensation. But to the best of your ability, monitor your humidity and try to maintain it in all buildings. But great question. I think I have one final question. Um... And it's in the context of, of hospitals uh, in Ireland. The, the observation is that in, 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 in most hospitals, at least, that humidifiers have been either decommissioned or removed or, or simply not installed in the first place. So is this good practice? No, it's terrible practice. And um, when I was in med school, I was in the Mater Hospital in Dublin. And uh, I didn't know anything about humidity, but um, no, it's a, it's a terrible practice. And it's one that I we need to, sorry, my dog is drinking. We need to rethink. Okay. And speaking of drinking water, um, oral rehydration, it definitely helps our, our bodies stay, Louis, 
it definitely helps our body stay hydrated, but it doesn't immediately replace the fluid losses from breathing and from our skin because they're different tissue compartments. In case all of you are reaching for your for your water bottles right now. Um, this is definitely the last question. Um, it, it's just come in now. It, 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 it's the question of carbon dioxide. Um, is it a good measure? Or, well, I guess it's a proxy measurement for air quality, uh, but also humidity level. Um, I guess that's in the context that human um, uh, breeding will certainly increase the CO2 levels uh, and will also increase the absolute uh, moisture uh, humidity level and also by association if the temperature is constant, the RH. But I, I, I suppose this question is really asking, do humans have a significant effect on the humidity level within space? And I, I guess it, I, I'm, I'm almost answering the question as it's been asked. We, we, we're all familiar if we go into a cinema after two or three hours, that's poorly ventilated, you can feel it. But again, from your experience, do you have any observations on that? Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. So for example, in an airplane, if you're in a fully loaded airplane on a six hour flight, the humidity level at the end of the flight is going to be higher than say a, a fairly empty airplane because mm -hmm. we do release moisture into the air when it's dry. And you know, second law of thermodynamics says the universe is always moving towards equilibrium. So if you have a dry environment with a nice, well hydrated, moisture filled human being, the second law of thermodynamics dictates that the moisture will be withdrawn from the person and put into the environment which again, that's why we get dehydrated. So CO2 is, is a good proxy measurement for human occupation, but I think if you're interested in humidity, better to get a hygrometer and, sure. and measure it specifically. All right, well, Stephanie, uh, thank you again for joining us here at the Irish chapter. Um, we're delighted that you're able to join us and we really do appreciate the, the time and effort that you've uh, made available, both in, in preparing your presentation and I guess taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. I know for you, a full day's work lies in front of you. For us here, we have half a day, done, but hopefully um, the, the, there's lots of compliments coming in from, from the audience. We had about uh, 50 people uh, watching uh, or listening and they've been all very complimentary. So we really do appreciate uh, your time and contribution. And we hope perhaps we can see you again. Perhaps you might take a visit to Ireland if, if you're here physically, uh, hopefully in the next 12 months, but for sure we hope in the next two years. Uh, feel free to to look up the Irish chapter. We would be delighted to host you again if if you wish to to give a a physical talk, let's say, uh, to our members. So thank well, you again. Too. In, so if you invite me as a distinguished lecturer, Ashray pays for my. Um, That's right. Yes. The, my travel, and I I've been to India and Africa and Brazil. So mm -hmm. I I would love, I would love. I have a special uh, feeling for Ireland because of my mm -hmm. heritage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank Indeed. you so much. Indeed. So thank you again. So uh, I'm going to finish up with uh, two or three slides just to uh, conclude the, the event. And um, uh, at this point, I'll say goodbye to you, Stephanie. Um, Bye. Thank you very much. And thank you again. So in the context of, of our talk, so again, thanks to, to Stephanie and uh, her presentation. Um, just going to very briefly tell you a little bit about the ASHRAE Board of uh, Governors. Um, this is the, the, the makeup with some of our, our leadership um, people uh, on the top there. And also you can see there in the table, we're organized into a number of subcommittees that look after different uh, topics and issues. And you can see uh, the various members there. But we recently had our AGM and uh, we hope to, or we will continue over the next year. I think most of our, our activities will be done online. Uh, this presents challenges because we're not having the traditional networking type events, but it also gives us great opportunities because we're able to, to, to host and to facilitate fellow uh, ASHRAE members right across the world to, 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 to contribute and to make presentations that hopefully will be of interest to you. 
So in that context, we have our, our COVID mini series. You've already seen this slide, so we, we've just gotten to, to slide number four. And again, thank you, Stephanie, for a really interesting presentation. We haven't quite filled our slots for the next four, but we will have, uh, or at least we hope to have something uh, two weeks from now on the 13th of August. As soon as we have that uh, available and confirmed, we will let you know by, by email. So feel free, if it's of interest to you, to, to join again at that time. Uh, finally, I'd like to, to thank our sponsors and supporters. They're listed there. Uh, their support has been uh, immense over the last five years since we started in 2014. And without you supporting us, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So we really do appreciate your support, both um, in, 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 I guess in, in, in supporting our activities, but also critically uh, providing or giving us uh, financial support to host our activities. So with that, I will finish. And um, I'd like to thank uh, everyone today who attended and also behind the scenes, uh, Daniel uh, Coakley, uh, who basically has been instrumental in, in, in setting up this whole series and um, really appreciate the, 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 the contribution and input of Daniel. And again, to thank, thank uh, Stephanie for her presentation, which was most interesting for all of us and um, was really timely in, in, in the context of the uh, situation that we are now uh, addressing and I think will be with us for some time yet. So thank you all very much and um, I wish you a good day and hopefully we'll see you again in two weeks time. Bye bye.